life. Hope you're having yourselves a fantastic morning this morning and making the most of all that is out there for you in this beautiful world. So please be good to each other and be good to yourselves as always. Welcome here inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Cafe Kubal on 3501 James Street, 324 West Water Street, and 401 South Salina Street, all in Syracuse, New York. You also find them on 343 Fayette Street in Manlius and on the corner of Route 11 and Taft Road at Sweetheart Corners there in their drive through location in North Syracuse. So make sure you head out to Cafe Kubal today. And if you're out of town and you want to order it and have it sent right to you and you've heard me talk about it enough that you want to give it a try, go to CafeKubal.com. That's Cafe, K-U-B-A-L.com, CafeKubal.com. So make sure that you do that today. And we thank you so much for those of you that are out there supporting local. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that as this is my community of Central and Upstate New York, and it means more to me than I can say. So, supporting local is supporting us all. With that being stated, inside of MonPazPopcorn.com's What's Poppin' today's broadcast is going to start off in hour number one, speaking on the NBA Finals. What happened to the Celtics, and where have they been? Interesting game, right? Kind of played their way out of the first half, came back, in the second half, and then lost it again in the second half. And we'll discuss how the Celtics are beating themselves right now, not to take anything away from the Warriors, just to make the real statement that the Celtics are truly finding ways to beat themselves. So we'll talk about that this morning in hour number one of the broadcast. And from there, we will jump into hour number two at 10 a.m. Eastern time as my guest of the day. We'll be joining me here, Dr. John Steinbrecher. Dr. John Steinbrecher, the commissioner of the MAC, the Mid-American Conference. A lot of you know what mac is all about. Get some mac and that is something that we'll talk about today, as well as speaking about the strength and evolution of his conference and the overall grander look at NIL, the transfer portal, the future of the NCAA, and collegiate athletics as we know it. So, a lot of great stuff coming up from a conference that has found a way to be in all of this realignment and reclassification consistent. Their membership has actually found a way to be strong and unified, which is huge. So, we'll talk with Dr. John Steinbrecher about the MAC and what it is about this conference that makes it so special, including the fact that they've been able to stay together when we talk about the institutions that make up the MAC. And then we'll jump into a double dose of the ingredients to success today. So you get two helpings of the ingredients to success, and they're proudly presented by Avicoli's. And everybody knows if you go to get Avicoli's and you got two helpings of anything, you're getting two helpings of greatness there. So whether it's the veal parmesan or any of their baked ziti or baked dishes, their seafood, their salads, and of course their pizza, and their barbecue chicken pizza is fantastical. So make sure that you go out there and get yourself a pie or a slice today at Avicoli's. We'll be doing the ingredients to success, a double helping of that at around 10.45 a.m. Eastern Time this morning, right after Dr. John Steinbrecher is on the broadcast. So very happy to be bringing that to you. And we will do that around 10.45 a.m. Eastern Time for the Ingredients to Success, a positive, charged segment that we have here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, one of many positively charged segments, because we're all about being positive, we're all about helping each other, and we're all about finding a better way to move forward together. So we will be enjoying that in just a little bit. And like I said, we'll start off the broadcast here with some conversation about the NBA Finals. And please, 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 please be sure to subscribe, join us, do all the great things you got to do. Facebook at Wake Up Call DT, uh, Twitter at Call DT, Instagram at Wake Up Call underscore DT. Follow us, join us, like us, all that good stuff. And of course, be with us on all of our outlets. We are here for you live Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And you'll have the opportunity to hang out with us on YouTube.com backslash wake up call DT, where some of you are right now, Facebook.com backslash wake up call DT, as well as Facebook.com backslash live now DT, and of course on mixlr.com backslash wake up call DT and on wake up call DT.com. So make sure you connect with us in any one of those avenues. And if you're on MixLR, Facebook, or YouTube, you can actually join us in the live feed. 
and you can give your thoughts in real time. So if you're on YouTube, Facebook, or or on MixLR, make sure that you're weighing in on your thoughts on the show and what's going on. We would love to definitely uh, hear from you, and we appreciate everybody that has written into the show over the years. So much appreciation of that. Those are your avenues, so make sure that you reach out today and let us know what you're thinking as we start the conversation off with the NBA Finals talk. Now, there's two, and I put this up last night, there's two things to me that I heard last night, you know, as the commentators are talking and whatnot, there's two things they were talking about last night, and those two things have been talked about before in this series, and that is the fact that the Boston Celtics miss free throws, okay? It's as simple as that. They miss free shots. Jason Tatum at the line is a 50-50 guy. He's a 50-50 guy. He goes up to the line, and I can't tell you how many times I have seen him in recent history, including last night, bunk one of those. And I'm like, it's a free shot for a guy. And the thing is about, you know, like a player like Jason Tatum or a player like Steph Curry or something like that, I mean, this isn't Shaquille O'Neal shooting free throws, right? These are good players that can shoot arguably from anywhere. So if you have the range, why can't you make a a mid-range, uncontested, stand still, take your time to shoot shot? I don't understand that. I don't get it. I really don't. And so that's one of the things that's bothered me. The second thing is the turnovers, I mean, you turn the ball over almost 20 times a game, say goodbye to that victory. It's not going to happen. Okay, nine times out of ten, if you turn the ball over that much, nothing good is going to come from that. And last night, the Boston Celtics had 18 turnovers. 18 turnovers. Blech. You know what I mean? So there's two things that the Boston Celtics, and I'm not trying to take away from but think about this last night. Think about this. Just follow me down this road. Last night, we're not talking about, oh my gosh, Steph Curry was balling out. Steph Curry wasn't balling out last night when it came to shooting his shot. He wasn't making a lot out there. Steph Curry had an off night, and they won by double digits. Why? Turnovers and missed free throws. Look at Boston. Boston missed 10 free throws. How many points did they lose by? 10. Do you know how many games I cover where I can look at that? And say that to you? How many times I can go and say that literally the the separation between winning and losing a game or tying the game and forcing overtime was right at the line? 10 missed free throws and they lost by 10. 21 of 31 and they lost by 10. So look at that. Steph Curry last night. This is Steph Curry's numbers last night. Okay, 16 points, which I'd be happy in an NBA Finals even playing the game, let alone score 16. But that's atypical of Steph Curry, which is obviously a promotion of him in the way that he plays because the man is constantly just a phenom. 16 points in 37 minutes. 7 of 22 from the field. And how about this? You don't hear this often. Steph Curry did not make a single three-point shot. He didn't miss this. He didn't make a single three-point shot. 0 for 9. So on a night where he goes 0 for 9 from 3, 0 for 9 from 3, and scores 16 points, you lose by 10. Why? Because you turn the ball over 18 times and you miss 10 free throws. That's why. That's what happened. Okay? That is that is what happened. It's as simple as that. Again, I'm not trying to take away from the Warriors and what they did and how they capitalized. I'm not trying to take anything away from the Warriors. I just have to state an obvious fact. The Boston Celtics are helping the Warriors win their next championship. They're helping them do it because they can't hold on to the ball and take care of it. And again, missed free throws. I did this with Dwight Howard years ago. The Magic had lost by around 10 or 12 points, and he missed the same. He missed the majority of those free throws, if not all of those free throws. It was like you missed 10 free throws and you lost by 10. What are your thoughts? You know, it's like you you lost by 12 and you missed 10 free throws. And I remember him looking at me going, really, dude? Like, you're going to ask me that question? And I was like, yeah, because you missed free shots and you lost by the margin of those free shots. They're free shots. You're an NBA Finals team. You shouldn't be shook at the line. You shouldn't be nervous at the line. 
And how do you miss free throws as an NBA player, especially when some people consider you a superstar? Tatum was 2 for 6 at the line. Okay? Jalen Brown went 8 for 10. Marcus Smart went 3 for 4. 2 for 6. Nobody missed more free throws than Jason Tatum last night. Nobody. Horford went 1 of 2. Williams went 2 of 2. And when I say Williams went 2 of 2, I'm speaking about Robert Williams the third. He goes 2 of 2. I mean, folks... It's that freaking simple. They lost by 10. They missed 10 free throws. Steph Curry had an off night, didn't make a single three, and you turned the ball over to the Warriors 18 times. It's as simple as that. If this was Jim Beheim standing at the podium, he would say, we missed our free throws, we turned the ball over too much, have a great night. He'd take his paper and his water and he would leave. Because that's what it is. That's what happened. And it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that this is what we're seeing. And I just, I don't understand. I don't understand it. Okay? You made it all the way here, and you're going to force your way out of the NBA Finals. That's what it looks like. Now, with that being stated, one of the guys that stepped up that I thought, hey, this guy could be a catalyst for it, Dave Paziak and I were talking about it, in DT and DP, 26 points in 43 minutes, 12 of 23 from the field, missed all six of his three-point shots, but had... 13 rebounds, 12 of them defensively, 2 assists, 2 steals, 1 block, no turnovers. Andrew Wiggins, 26 points, 12 makes, 23 attempts. If you take away those 3-point attempts, he was 12 for 17 from inside the arc. 13 rebounds and a double-double, 2 assists, 2 steals, 1 block, no turnovers. Yes on yes on yes on yes. And by the way, Steph Curry last night, had one turnover, one steal, so, you know, even that out, and eight assists. So even though he had 16 points and struggled to shoot, he did have eight assists in the game, and he led the team. So, and six assists went to Draymond Green. But Draymond Green is still being an idiot, and I'm I'm just, I'm over the Draymond Green thing. Like, what, I mean, at one point in the game, he wouldn't give the ball back. He just walked away with the ball. It's like, are you seven years old? Like, I remember playing basketball and somebody wouldn't give the ball back because they were a poor sport and they were a baby and they lost the game and it didn't go their way. I'm not giving anybody the ball because if I have the ball, then nobody can play. Like, this is a grown man. This is a grown individual now. This is this is life. This is what the NBA has to offer us. Draymond Big Baby Green. Don't talk about Glenn Big Baby Davis. It's Draymond Big Baby Green. Boo-hoo baby. Like, you've won championships. You get to play with a team that is one of the greatest teams that we may ever see in the history of the NBA for what they've done in the amount of time that they've done it. You get to play with Klay Thompson. You get to play with Steph Curry. You've gotten to play with Kevin Durant. And I'm not saying you can't dish the ball off. And I'm not saying you can't rebound at times. But you are a baby. You're holding on to the ball. And again, special set of rules for Draymond Green. There's a special set of rules for Draymond Green. There is. It's just how it is. There is a special set of rules for him. Because he can go take a ball like... If I took a ball like that in a high school game, that's a technical foul. If I said to the ref, piss on you, I'm not giving you the ball back, that's a technical foul. Okay? It's a technical foul. Draymond Green is a technical foul waiting to happen. I want to I want to log his time between idiot idiocy and idiocy, because you know yesterday and you got Jalen Brown and him have been tussling in this series, but you got them on the ground and going back and forth and this and that. They're wrestling each other. I mean, it's just it's stupid. It's stupid. You know. And yeah, he tries to get in your head. And yeah, he tries to bother you. But it's like, if you're an official, what are you told? Call this foul every time unless it's Draymond Green. Eject this player every time. If if, if any player does this thing, eject them unless you're Draymond Green. What is What are uh, officials in the NBA now impersonating the NCAA's front office? 
Do to one which you will not do to the other. Suspend one which will not suspend the other. Eject one which will not eject the other. Is that the world that we live in today? Because it's, I mean, to me, it's laughably ridiculous. Draymond Green is not good for the game. He's a baby. He's a baby. That's all he is. He's a little, tiny child. He didn't get enough attention in school. He is literally, I honestly think that if I met somebody that knew Draymond Green when he was eight years old and somebody that knows him now, they would tell me he's the same person. They'd be like, on the playground, he used to steal the ball and he used to fight with all the kids and not let anybody play with it and he'd laugh at you when he wouldn't let anybody get the ball. Like, that's him. That's Draymond. Eight years old to whatever the heck he is now. Same old song and dance, my friend. But it's, I mean, to me, listen, I don't have a dog in the race in this. I'm a Raptors fan. So I'm watching the Celtics and I'm watching the Warriors. And I, I respect the Warriors. And I have over the years. Go check the tape. I've respected the Warriors for a long time. Steph Curry is one of my favorite players of all time. And I respect the Celtics. It's my grandfather's team, Jerry Hart's team, good friend of mine, and my Aunt Donna's team. So, you know, I have nothing against the Celtics. I have nothing against the Warriors. I'm watching this game as a fan of the game. And Draymond Green is annoying. He stops play, and he's annoying. He likes to fight with people. He knows that he's not relevant. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what it is, is that he is afraid that he won't be relevant unless he makes himself. You know, when they say, like, you're not famous, so you want to be infamous, like you just want people to talk about you, you don't care if it's positive or negative. It's like Draymond Green knows Steph Curry's going to make the shots. He knows... He knows, you know, Clay Thompson's going to make the shots. He knows guys like Poole can step it up and have made some big-time shots. He knows different players have different roles on the team, and his role is to be a complete nuisance so that he can get on the paper and somebody can talk about him in the morning on their show. Because if for not, like, if you look at his stat line, what did he do last night? Draymond Green, 8 points, 8 rebounds, 6 assists, a steal, and 2 turnovers. Not bad. Not a superstar irrelevant on a team that is not the Warriors or maybe, you know, one of these upper echelon teams, irrelevant. Eight points, eight rebounds, 35 minutes. You know? Wiggins had 26 and 13. You had eight and eight. Okay? I mean, so to me... Is Draymond Green a necessary evil for the Warriors? That they, you know, that it's like, hey, we'll accept his antics because they help. You know, they don't they don't necessarily hurt us. They bother the other team. And if we lose him and he gets ejected, who cares? Because he doesn't score that much. I mean, is it kind of one of those things where it's like, he's a rabid dog, but he's our rabid dog. So if he bites somebody, fine. If they call the cops, well, we don't really need the dog. I mean, that's kind of how I look at it, right? We don't really need the dog. Because if he goes out of the game, you miss a few assists and some rebounds, you know? But he's not a guy who is who is a, a phenom, right? That's like, oh my lord, we got to keep Draymond Green in the game. So, you know, that's, that's the thing to me that is frustrating. Now, if you look at... Because this is, this is what he is career-wise. These are, as a career, all with Golden State from 2012 to now. So happy 10-year anniversary to Draymond Green, first and foremost. 8.7 points a game and 6.9 rebounds a game. 5.4 assists per game. So he averaged under 10 points, under 10 rebounds, and 5.4 assists. It's not bad. He's a role player. That's a good role. That's a good role to have. That's a consistent role, right? I almost give you a double-double, and I get you, and as and in the front court, I get you five assists a game. In the front court, I have good eyes. But you also have Steph Curry on your team, and you also have Clay Thompson on your team. So it's easy to get those assists, right? So when you see that, I, I give him credit for having good eyes. But, I mean, this man's had... 7.4, 7, 7.3, 6.9, 6.2, 8.9, 7.0 assists per game in his career outside of years where he had 3.7, 1.9, and, and 0 0.7, which were his first three seasons. Since 2015 to now, 7.4, 7.0, 7.3, 6.9, 6.2, 8.9, 7.0, in that order. 7.0 being this season, assists per game, right? His rebounds have stayed around 7. And his he's averaged double digits in points per game in four seasons, 
11.7 and 2014-15, then 14, then 10.2, then 11.0 and 2017-18. So in a four-year span, he did it. Since then, 7.4, 8.0, 7.0, 7.5. Now, those numbers aren't great. I think the assist number is the one that stands out to me the most because that's the thing that would make me enticed to keep him on the team. But what I'm getting at is the fact that, you know, he doesn't have these crazy, incredible numbers, right? He's a 71% free throw shooter in the front court. and But this is the thing that I find hilarious. He averaged, from the beginning of his career to now, he averaged... 2, 2.8, 3.2, 3.0, 2.9, 2.6, 3.0, 2.6, 3.1, and 3.0 personal fouls per game. He averages around three personal fouls a game. That is BS. Those numbers are false. He should be averaging six every season <laughs> per game. The way that he plays, three per game, if I did what he did, I'd be ejected. I'd be suspended. I'd be talked to by my coach. There'd be a threat to get me out of the league that I'm in. But not this guy. Not, not You gotta take care of Draymond Green. You know, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why he gets the special treatment. Is it because he plays for Golden State? Like, what if he went and played for the Denver Nuggets? Would he get the same treatment? Because to me, this is just... It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It is. He averages three fouls a game. That's a joke. That's a funny joke. That's a very funny, hilarious joke. But, yeah, he's an 8.7, 6.9. Those are his numbers. They're not bad. They're good They're good roll numbers. They're good roll. Listen, he's consistent. He is consistent. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. If I have a guy that's almost a double-double every night, that's good. But would he be relevant elsewhere? Would, would 8.7 and 6.9 cut it if he was on a different NBA team? And above everything, to not... Listen, this this is where I stand. Because I get, I get an upset stomach thinking about... Okay, because I want to be clear about this. I respect everybody that makes it to the NBA because it's it's dang near impossible to thread that needle. Okay? And not only, stay in the, not only get to the NBA, but stay in the NBA and have longevity and have 10 years in. Congratulations to Draymond Green. Okay? I want to be clear about that. And I'm not trying to knock his numbers. What I'm saying to you is, what is his point of being on this team? What is the point of him being on this team? Is he is it because he, he's got good eyes and he can assist you? What is the point of Draymond Green? Besides the fact that he's the rabid dog that you're not afraid to lose. You're not afraid to lose him for a game. Because he plays selfishly in his antics but unselfishly with his assists. And, I mean, it's worked for the Warriors, and they've won numerous championships, but I want to sit down with the Warriors. When all is said and done, I want to sit down with the Warriors. I want to ask Steph Curry. I want to ask, you know, Clay Thompson. I want to ask Jordan Poole. I, I want to sit down with these. I want to ask. I want to go back and ask Kevin Durant. I want to sit down with these guys, and I want to know. I want to talk to Otto Porter Jr. and Andre Iguodala and say, what did you think about playing with him? What was the reason why you thought he was a necessary evil on the team? Because when you watch these games, you can bet on Steph Curry nine times out of ten, drain in a three. You can bet on, it, and you know, for the playoffs now, you can bet on Poole hitting a last-second shot. You can bet on Andre Iguodala still being relevant. And you can bet on Draymond Green stopping play for something that has nothing to do with the actual game of basketball. And it's like somebody who interrupts the class to tell a joke. It may be funny the first time. It may be funny the second time. But after going to class for 27 days and knowing that this person's always going to waste time and stop everything, you get to a point where you're like, you know what, dude, can you just shut up so we can learn? Because, like, I got to know the information. And it was funny the first time, and it was funny the second time, and it was funny the third time. But, you know, we have a test on Friday, and if you don't let the teacher teach, I'm not going to know what the hell I'm studying, and I'm not going to be prepared. 
And that's, I mean, listen, again, it's been able, it's worked for the Warriors. For whatever reason, it's been able to work. But it's just a, it's a part of the game that I just think is, is ridiculous and it's unnecessary. And to know that he doesn't get called for fouls when we have to, you know, sit and debate for three days if somebody should be suspended over one call where he should be suspended over pretty much all of them. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's, and obviously I'm being facetious there, but you know what I mean. He, when we sit and we deliberate, you know, about like, oh, well, this foul on Gary Payton the second, was it flagrant? Was it not? Should he be suspended? Should he not be suspended? Blah, 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 blah. And then here's Draymond Green. Foul, 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 foul. They may have foul out in the first quarter of a game, but they don't call the free, they don't call the fouls on him. And, you know, Michael Jordan didn't get fouls called on him, but for like different reasons, right? They didn't want Jordan out of the game. And because Jordan, I mean, he was a different player, right? He was, you know, to many, the greatest player of all time. So, you know, it was a different world. But there's certain people that, that you just don't foul out of a game. And apparently there's, an, there's a, an unwritten or written rule with the NBA officials that you don't call Draymond Green for the 972 fouls that he commits a game. You call him for three of those. So... You know, it's ridiculous. But I do want to give credit to Andrew Wiggins because Wiggs played very well in this game. And it was on my mind, like, is he going to show up? Is there going to be, like, that moment? And and he had that moment. Now, if he has that moment in game six, then this this is this is done. You know what I mean? Like, I'm the fact that Wiggins – and that's the thing about a championship caliber team is that when somebody drops in their – in their output, right, and what and what you're used to seeing from them, when somebody's work kind of falls down, right, Steph Curry's dips down, right, your expectation of them isn't there that night. That's the night that Wiggins decides to play his best game. You know what I mean? Those are the teams, like Clay Thompson has a bad night, but Steph picks it up. Oh, well, Draymond Green got a bunch of assists and moved the ball around because Poole struggled to do this. And you know, you know what I mean? So it's like there's different things that you see in a championship caliber team where somebody just picks up the slack. And the Celtics have had it as well. But the problem with the Celtics is, is those two things that I told you. The problems, with the, Cel- the problems with the Celtics are the Celtics. The Celtics struggle at not being their own worst enemy. That is what they struggle from because they can't seem to get out of their own way when it comes to missing free throws and turning the ball over. I mean, you look at the Boston Celtics throughout this. Let's just look at the series, okay? We're going to take a look at this. We're going to break this series down piece by piece here, and we're going to take a look at it. So the Celtics won game one against the Warriors, okay? They win game one against the Warriors. We take a look at game one against the Warriors, and in that game, the Boston Celtics won by 12, and they turned the ball over 12 times, okay? Not great, but they turned the ball over 12 times. 14 turnovers for Golden State. So Golden State turned the ball over more than the Boston Celtics in game one, which the Boston Celtics won. In Game 2, which the Boston Celtics lost by 19, the Boston Celtics in that game that they lost by 19, a 107 to 88, we take a look at the numbers on that. Now remember, Game 1, 12 turnovers, 1 by 12, and the Warriors had more turnovers with 14. In the game where they lost by 19, the Boston Celtics had 18 turnovers, and Golden State has had less with 12. Then we go to game three that the Boston Celtics won. And in game three for the Boston Celtics, we take a look at that, the 116 to 100 victory. In game three, the Boston Celtics in victory turn the ball over a total of 12 times. And Golden State had more turnovers with 16. You see my pattern? So, in the games they won, they had 12 turnovers, and Golden State had more. In the game that they lost, they had 18 turnovers when they lost by 19. In game four, which they lost by 10, 
in Game 4 for the Boston Celtics, a loss for them 107-97. to The Boston Celtics in that game had 15 turnovers, and this was a unique circumstance. The Golden State Warriors had 16, but Boston still had more than, greater than 12 turnovers. They had 15 turnovers. They lost by 10. And then last night, they had 18 turnovers in Game 5. 18 turnovers to lose 104 to 94. And with those 18 turnovers that the Boston Celtics had in their 10 point loss in game number five, the Golden State Warriors had six turnovers. So look at it, okay? Just look at it. The Boston Celtics, in all of their victories, and they're doing, well, I should say, in their two victories, they had 12 turnovers. In their losses, 18, 18, 15. The case is simply right there, right in front of you. The Golden State Warriors, nobody needs extra opportunities. Nobody needs extra ways to have a chance to beat you. The Golden State Warriors don't need that. If Steph Curry was on last night with those 18 turnovers by Boston, then they would have won by 25. Okay, Boston got lucky that they lost by 10 because Steph had an off shooting night. It's 16 points and 0 for 9 from 3. If he makes three of those threes, four of those, if he makes four of those threes, let's say, then they win by a lot larger of a margin. You know, and this, and and because there was no stopping Boston from beating Boston. 18 turnovers, 18 turnovers, and 15 turnovers in their losses. Just look at that. And last night, six turnovers for Golden State compared to 18 for Boston? Come on now. Come on now. It doesn't get more blatant than that. Boston can't hold on to the ball, and that's why Boston didn't hold on to the lead of this series. Also, it's the first time all postseason through every series that Boston's been in. Boston, since the beginning of the NBA playoffs here in 2022, had not lost a game after losing a game. They had never lost two consecutive games until last night. So that streak of seven straight wins, 7-0, and coming off of a loss in the NBA playoffs this season, is now broken as they lost their first game after a loss in the playoffs. The first time they've ever lost two games in a row in the 2022 postseason. They were 7-0 and after a loss, and now that streak has ended last night thanks to their 18 turnovers and 10 missed free throws. If I was a coach, I'd be livid. I'd be like, you missed free shots and you gave them extra possessions. Golden State doesn't need your help. They made it to the finals for a reason, but you gave them a heck of a lot of help. So that's something to look to. We'll take a step aside for a fast break. We'll come back with plenty more wake-up call right after this inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Thank you so much for being with us this this Tuesday and every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Avicoli's, located on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, has been your trusted neighbor for decades. Located just steps from Liverpool High School, we're happy to have the Liverpool Warriors on-site, on-location broadcast at Avicoli's through Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora every single month, featuring student athletes, coaches, and administration throughout the year from Liverpool High School. Head out to Avicoli's today on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, open Tuesday through Sunday for lunch, dinner, and drinks. We'd love to see you out there. And of course, you can call them at 315-622-5100 for takeout, delivery, and catering. That's 315-622-5100. And also find them on myavicolis.com. That's myavicolis.com. Having peace of mind when you're out of town, that your furry loving friend is safe and sound, means taking them to Canine Campground. Because we all know that when it comes to the love of our pets, it goes well beyond the call of duty to make sure they're safe and sound. Right, Lily? 
So take a ride to 242 Johnson Street in East Syracuse, New York, and see Canine Campground and where your dog will be staying, in the classic cabin, the executive cabin, the grand cabin, or of course, the luxury cabin, because if you know Lily, you know she loves luxury. <laughs> now you don't have to wait to the last minute to find a family member or a friend that'll take your dog for a few days. Call Canine Campground at 315-299-4013. That's 315-299-4013. Their drop-off and pick-up times are Monday through Sunday. Check K9Campground.com for more information. That's the letter K, the number 9, and campground spelled with a K, dot com. K9Campground.com. When you're going out of town, bring your dog to Canine Campground. PB&J's Lunchbox, the food truck that you love finding all throughout Central and Upstate New York, now has a street side cafe. So when you're craving their traditional favorites as well as their out-of-box amazing menu items, you can now head to 663 Old Liverpool Road in Liverpool, New York, located just minutes from the highway, the thruway, Destiny USA, and Onondaga Lake Parkway. PB&J's Lunchbox Street Side Cafe is there for you Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., serving breakfast, lunch, and and dinner all throughout the day. Get breakfast for dinner, dinner for lunch, whatever you fancy, including their award-winning grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Find them at 663 Old Liverpool Road in Liverpool, New York. PB&J's Lunchbox, where we love to know what's in your lunchbox. As a patient, what do we want? to be cared for, to be listened to, and to have someone walk us through the process on our path to victory. Victory Sports Medicine and Orthopedics does all of those things beautifully with Dr. Mark Petropoli leading the team on 791 West Genesee Street in Skinny Atlas, New York, located minutes from beautiful Skinny Atlas Lake. Whatever your injury may be from head to toe, preventative care, rehab, physical therapy, laser therapy, and surgery are all available at Victory Sports Medicine and Orthopedics where they care about us, they listen to us, and they understand that everyone's path to victory is a little bit different. Let them help you on yours by calling 315-685-7544 to make your appointment today. That's 315-685-7544. And find out more information at victorysportsmedicine.com. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios, hanging out with you where sports meets that thing called life. And appreciate you being here every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Cafe Kubal here for you on 3501 James Street, 324 West Water Street, 401 South Salina Street, all in Syracuse, New York, inside of their giant behemoth of a brown stripe building on 343 Fayette Street in Manly, where they have their double-decker opportunity for you, their double-decker cafe, with an all-new expanded parking lot, so come out and see them there. And, of course, you can find them on the corner of Route 11 and Taft Road at Sweetheart Corners in their drive through location. So make sure you head out to Cafe Kubal today and fill your cup up right and let them know that Wake Up Call sent you their way so much appreciation for that talking nba finals before the break here as the golden state warriors have done something to the celtics that have not happened to them all postseason which is hand them two losses in a row and on thursday at 9 p.m eastern time game six will happen in boston it is say or be quiet for the boston celtics they have to win if they win they will force a game seven i was hoping that the series would go seven and the boston celtics well, they get to determine if it does, or Golden State gets to determine if they shut it down. I'll tell you one thing, if Boston has 15 or more turnovers, they might as well say good night because they're going to need to do a heck of a lot of things to be in a situation where they don't lose a game turning the ball over that many times. I am so sick and tired of seeing that with Boston. I mean, it is. I mean, it's you're killing yourself. You're cutting your legs off trying to run essentially is what you're trying to do 15 turnovers 18 turnovers and 18 turnovers in their losses they need to get with it they need to get after it and they need to stop beating themselves so we'll see if boston can do that and force a game 
seven in this series. And then going on throughout the rest of the uh, sports world here, some other pieces that are going on here. And I definitely, uh, I'm excited to see this too. Uh, Dream On 30 for 30. It's going to be on ESPN premiering this Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm excited for that as we take a look at women's basketball. So uh, Dream On here as as we have in the studio, uh, seeing that that's, uh, that's coming up here uh, off camera here. We have the studio kind of running information so we can keep everything up to date for you and we're able to see everything here so definitely uh, appreciate that and appreciate the opportunity to bring you the up-to-date information uh, also you know taking a look at the fact that uh, we're in a new type of situation right now that the uh, pga tour has decided and i said we'll talk more about this as we go on but the pga tour suspending a bunch of players for wanting to play in the LIV tournament. And this is a very unique world that we're living in right now with the PGA. So I do want to uh, get to some thoughts on that and would love for you to share your thoughts as well as uh, Phil Mickelson shared his thoughts on the PGA Tour and what's going on. And so uh, taking a look here, let's see. Uh, now the decision here, now M Phil Mickelson uh, no longer, well, I'll take a look at, at what he had to say here because I, I want to I wanna address his thoughts and what he had to say when it comes to the PGA Tour and not being a part of it anymore. So let's take a look at uh, his, his thoughts here. You know, because it is, this is a weird, uh, it's just a, it's a very weird world here that we're living in right now with this so he really didn't say that much about it uh, phil mickelson was asked 28 questions and he was talking about people that may not like his decision. He said, quote, I respect and understand their opinions. I respect if they disagree, but at this time, this is the right decision for me. End quote. You know, he said, quote, I've done all I can do to help contribute to the game, contribute to the PGA Tour during my time with them, and that's all I can do. He said, I've earned that lifetime membership, so I believe that it should be my choice. So, it's, I mean, listen, I think the PGA Tour is eventually going to have to give. Because, are you really willing to lose all of these members? All of these members over being like, if if you're not with us and only us, then you can't, you can't, you know, you can only play in our sandbox. You can't play in anybody else's sandbox. If you're with my sandbox, you got to be in my sandbox at all times in my sandbox. Again, children. <laughs> you know what I mean? Draymond Green. Nobody can play if I take the ball. <laughs> and PGA Tour. If you go play, if you go play in somebody else's sandbox, you can't come play in my sandbox. You could go to that sandbox, but you can't come back here. Be a bird. No, stop. Let these people play. They're golfers. They're going to have a finite amount of time that they go out there and do that. And I guess what golf is maybe saying is, hey, if you play in the NFL, you can't play in the CFL. If you play in the NFL, you can't play in the XFL. You can't play in the USFL. You can't play in the NAF, but you know what? You can. You can. If you play in the NAF and the NFL sees you, you can play there. Now, can you go back and forth? I don't think so. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the NFL doesn't say, well, you started the season with the USFL and you can't play for us because you played for the blah, 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 blah. No, stop. Let them play. How many are you willing to lose? Phil Mickelson is a big time name. And people that are saying, well, the game has passed him. Okay, listen. He's Phil Mickelson. 
People will watch Phil Mickelson golf. People that don't know anything about golf know who Phil Mickelson is. There are people that know the bare minimum, and they know Phil Mickelson's name, and they know Tiger Woods' name. There are certain people that are that are on their radar, right? People talk about Sergio Garcia, may not know much anything about golf, may never watch it, but they knew about they know about him. There's certain players that you know that are recognizable. The PGA Tour can't sit here and say that Phil Mickelson didn't help make them what they are today. That he didn't guide them along and make them a, a you-know-what ton of money. So because he wants to go play in another tournament, you want to boo-hoo? Cry baby baby? Come on. Come on. To me, it's ridiculous. If he wants to go play or anybody wants to go play, then let them go play. You have a finite amount of time that you get to be an athlete. There is so few of a percentage that get to be a professional athlete. If you get paid to play the game that you love, you should have the opportunity to spread your wings. Okay? And if, if golf allows... This well, if they don't allow this world to happen, what are they saying here? What is the precedent? And does that deter people from joining the PGA Tour? Does that deter up and coming golfers from going? Well, I don't want to be restricted. I don't want to be banned. <laughs> so maybe I'll just not even sign in the first place because what if something comes up down the road that I want to be a part in, and I can't because of the PGA Tour. So, this is what it looks like. Jay Monahan said this, uh, why aren't players allowed to play in the LIV Golf and the PGA Tour? He said, quote, I'd, I'd answer the question by asking a question, and that is, why do, we need us, why do they need us so badly? Because those players have chosen to sign multi-year, lucrative contracts to play in a series of exhibition matches against the same players over and over again. You look at that versus what we see here today, and that's why they need us so badly. You've got true, pure competition, the best players in the world here at the RBC Canadian Open with millions of fans watching. End quote. So he thinks that the players need the tour more than the tour need the players. Now, will the suspended players be able to come back? Monahan said, quote, We made a decision last week to suspend those players, and they are no longer eligible for tournament play. And that, at this point, is all we're prepared to talk to. We will see how things continue to develop as we go down the road here, end quote. Yeah, you want to know why? Because you need them too, okay? It goes hand in hand. If you don't have Phil Mickelson over the last decade, then you lose some credibility. When you don't have Sergio Garcia and Brandon Grace and Dustin Johnson, Phil Mickelson, like I said, when you don't have these names, Lee Westwood, when you lose these names. Now, Westwood resigned his membership. Schwarzel resigned their membership. Pettit, Nah, Kamer, a bunch of these Dustin Johnson... Sergio Garcia, a bunch of the players that were suspended resigned their membership. Phil Mickelson did not. Matt Jones did not. Uh, Gooch did not. McDowell didn't. Ogletree didn't. Poulter didn't. Swafford. So some of them did not get rid of it, didn't resign it, and others did. Others, others got rid of it. Others said, okay, you know what? Our membership is over. Okay? And they did get rid of it. But not all of them. Not all of them. And the question becomes, should they be able to return? I don't think they should have been kicked out. <laughs> you know, but I think it's funny that the PGA Tour wants to tell us <laughs> they're going to need us more than we're going to need them. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm not a guy who watches golf every day. But some of the people that you just got rid of, those are the people that I would want to watch. So, you know, and those are the names that I knew. So the PGA Tour commissioner 
stating, Jay Monahan stating, hey, they need us. They need us. They're going to go make a lot of money. And I would imagine the LIV knows that by getting these players, they got to do things right. And I don't necessarily think they're doing it just for the money. I would think that someone that's been in the game for a while, like a Garcia or a Mickelson, would look at how the LIV are going to handle their tournament and what they're going to actually do. So the media around it, the promotion around it, the exposure of it. I don't think that they would just go for the money and go to a tournament that's not going to be well put together and not, that's not going to have good marketing and an opportunity to get out to the fans. Because obviously they want to play the game and they want you to see the game that they're playing. So, we'll see. Rory McIlroy, who just won the Canadian Open by two shots, he said, quote, I think going up against the best and beating the best always makes it extra special. And then, look, I alluded to it. I had extra motivation of what's going on across the pond. The guy that's spearheading that tour has 20 wins on the PGA Tour, and I was tied with him, and I wanted to get one ahead of him, and I did. So that was really cool for me. Just a little sense of pride on that one. End quote. Rory McIlroy taking a shot at Greg Norman, who is the LIV Golf CEO. Now, the LIV Golf Tournament will be played in the United States at Pumpkin Ridge Golf Club in Portland, Oregon, from June 30th to July 2nd. LIV Golf announced that it added a former U.S. Open champion Bryson DeChambeau, former Masters winner Patrick Reed, and Pat Perez to their roster. So we will see what goes on from here. Now, Monaghan said players who compete in future LIV golf events will have the same punishment as the 17 players that were suspended. And we'll go from there. Like... I don't know. I just think it's ridiculous. I think eventually Monaghan's going to have to back down at least a little bit on this. Now, Monaghan was asked a question about players being criticized for competing in the LIV golf tournament, which is financed by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. Now, survivors and family members of victims of the terrorist attack of September 11th, 2001, have been critical of the players because of the connection to Saudi Arabia. Monaghan said, quote, it probably is an issue for players that chose to go and take that money. And I think you have to ask yourself the question, why is this group spending so much money, billions of dollars, recruiting players and chasing a concept with no possibility of a return? At the same time, there's been a lot of questions, a lot of comments about growth of the game, and I asked, how is this good for the game that we love? I talked to players. I've had a player meeting, and I've talked to a member of players individually, a number of players individually for a long period of time, and I think you'd have to be living under a rock to not know that there are significant implications. And I would ask any player that has left or any player that would consider leaving, have you ever had to apologize for being a member of the PGA Tour? End quote. So, you know, the connection to Saudi Arabia... That would that would kind of that would kind of deter me, you know, because of I would want to know I shouldn't I would want to know more information because let's be real, okay. There's a lot of things that happen in this country that people publicly balk at things and privately take the money. So, you know, saying well this is the only Saudi Arabia thing that ever happened in America. No, it's not. So it's not. And <laughs> you'd be crazy to think that it is. So I think that for me, can we work out with the LIV golf tournament to get the gas prices down? That would be great. If they could do that, then we're talking about a nice golf tournament. LIV golf tournament where the players make money and the gas prices go down. How about that? How about for every shot under par, gas goes down 10 cents? 
or five cents for every shot under par, right? Maybe it goes down one cent because of how good they are. And we just keep ticking away, right? And then by the end of the tournament, gas is 352. I'm good with it. So we'll uh, take a step aside for a fast break on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets that thing called life. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Dr. John Steinbrecher as we continue our Commissioner Central series on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. There with the MAC, the Mid-American Commissioner, Dr. John Steinbrecher, talks with us about the strength and evolution of his conference, the, the solidarity and consistency of his membership, and we'll get into the bigger picture of NIL, the transfer portal, the NCAA, and the future of collegiate athletics as the Commissioner Central Series goes from all around the country on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. To get the thoughts and opinions of commissioners and executive directors from around our beautiful nation on what they see from their conference window and what they see overall in the grand scope of collegiate athletics. That's coming up with the MAC for some action. Come back to Wake Up Call right after this fast break and you hear from some of our great partners in our community. From inside of the Cafe Coupal Studios, this is where sports meets life, and we'll see you in just a moment. Carvel DeWitt, it's what happy tastes like. Do you know why? Because we make ice cream. Creamy, rich, flavorful ice cream. Not yogurt or iced milk like some of our competitors. Ice cream. Fresh, by hand, daily. For the calorie conscious, we have something new for you. Our new Carvelite. Same great flavor, creaminess, and texture of our regular ice cream with only 35 calories an ounce. So whether you want an ice cream cake, flying saucer, dasher, Carvelanche, hard or soft ice cream, we will satisfy your craving with our fresh, handmade, regular, or new Carvelite ice cream. Carvel DeWitt. It's what happy tastes like. Cafe Cabal offers same-day local delivery of our products, offering no delivery charge for Onondaga County. Shop CafeCabal.com for fresh roasted coffee beans, cold brew, travel mugs, and all your essential Cafe Cabal needs. Cafe Cabal, coffee for the soul. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is located on 3680 Milton Avenue in the Home Depot Plaza. It is your family-friendly sports bar and restaurant. Folks, some sports bars aren't family-friendly. Some family-friendly restaurants are not sports bars. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is proud to be both. It is that marriage that you've been looking for for years. The Wildcat Sports Pub is your home base for your sports bar and restaurant needs, games for the kids, indoor and outdoor activities, and enough things on the menu to come back every single week and get to try something new. They're open Sundays from noon to 8 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Thursday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to midnight. For reservations and party information, call 315 315- 487-2222 for the Wildcat family-friendly sports pub and restaurant. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Proud to be here with you on YouTube.com, Facebook.com, and MixLR.com, all backslash Wake Up Call DT. Inside of these Cafe Kubal Studios, you're also on Wake Up Call DT.com and on Facebook.com backslash Live Now DT. Our Commissioner Central Series continues today with the MAC Conference. You all know about that MAC Shin, the Mid American Conference, and their commissioner here with us, Dr. John Steinbracker, and very happy to have John on the show today. John, how you doing? Great to be with you. And John, uh, first and foremost here, I know your history has uh, seen you in your journey uh, be in different parts of the world of collegiate athletics, uh, different conferences, and able to lead those conferences, the Ohio Valley Conference, as well as the Mid-Continent Conference, which is now the Summit League, and of course, 
the uh, the MAC. Just what you can say about you know being a commissioner of three different conferences. Just what that has done for your history and, and your knowledge and wisdom of the collegiate world as well. Well, I suppose it could be argued I can't hold a job if I keep moving conferences, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's hope not. No, what what is it's afforded me the opportunity to really be across all three subdivisions of Division One, and so I I think I have a pretty good sense of uh, the various issues and and how or the lens that different conferences may look at them, whether it's. The, uh, a conference that doesn't have football, an FCS conference, and now an FBS conference. And there are some differences, and just in terms of, of, of uh, relative pieces of importance, uh, where, where the pressure points are, and so on. In, in many cases, the, the challenges or problems are the same. It's just the solutions may be a little different. There may be a few more zeros attached to uh, the revenues you generate and so on. Uh, but I, I guess I just have a, a pretty broad base of experience across all of Division One. And when you look at that, when you look at FBS, FCS, and then Division One schools that don't have football, what have you taken away from the different models that you've worked with? Well, at, at the root of it all uh, is a commitment to the student-athlete and the student-athlete experience. And that's an experience that's well beyond what they do on the field. It has to do with providing the absolute best we can provide in terms of academic support, social support, nutrition, health care, just an array of services that it's, it's, it's never been a better time to be a student athlete than it is now. It is just the, the opportunities, uh, the support services, all those combined to make it, being a student athlete is a pretty neat thing. Yeah, you know, and, and looking at the world of, of student athlete, I mean, this is this is a world that has consistently evolved, and we're in a place right now where you know, name, image, and likeness, aka NIL, as well as the transfer portal, has has opened up the definition of student athlete, changed it, expanded it. How do you view it? Is it is it changing what a student athlete is? Is it expanding on the definition of student athlete? How do you look at it? I think it's evolving, okay. and it's it's evolving as a result of what we're seeing at the upper ends, particularly the FBS level, just in terms of the uh, revenue generation that is there. And at, at some point, it starts to look impolite when you have, again, this is a, a small minority of the coaches, but it's the most heavily publicized segment of the coaches. Yes, segment of coaches who are making an awful lot of money, and and so we've devalued the the value of a of, a, of an education, which is regretful. Uh, getting a scholarship, having the ability to complete an education, is incredibly valued, is valuable to someone. Yet over the past 10, 15 plus years, we've decided. We don't see the value quite as much in that anymore. And so that's, that's okay. And so it's evolved. And this, this whole concept of amateurism has evolved. And that's not nothing new. That's been evolving since the 1920s, quite frankly. And, and so we continue to, to model it, remodel it, change it, alter it. And so with, with name, image, and likeness, what a wonderful opportunity for student athletes who have the interest and the time uh, to want to, in essence, market themselves and be able to take advantage of some opportunities. Where the challenge comes into it for me is when it evolves not to uh, NIL, where it simply evolves into pay for play. And I'm fearful that some of these collectives we read about are, in essence, being used as a way to uh, simply to entice recruits uh, and what I would call pay-for-play schemes, that doesn't match very well with our model. But we're in an unregulated space. We'll see how that continues to evolve. Uh, you know, and speaking here with Dr. John Steinbrecher, the commissioner of the MAC, and like you said, looking at how things evolve and, and where we go from here, and, and collective is a word that's been brought up when we're looking at NIL and whatnot. 
you know, the, the transfer portal allowing a one-time transfer where you can go to any school with, in most cases within your conference without having to sit out a year except for the SOCON and the Big South. And outside of that, you know, you can essentially go anywhere, not have to sit out. It's free agency. NIL being a recruiting tool, which it wasn't supposed to be, but knowing that we live in a world where that is existent, if you're in the transfer portal, that can come up of, of you know, NIL. And I've spoken with coaches at different divisional levels that have told me flat out, hey, you know, the second question I get when a recruit comes on campus to visit is what does the NIL situation look like? What do you think about name, image, and likeness being used as a recru recruiting tool as well as uh, something to essentially uh, jockey somebody away from somewhere else? And then we start getting into the world of what's going on as far as tampering and whatnot. Well, I think it's, it's, it's logical that student athletes would, would ask about you know what kind of what kind of opportunities have your student athletes had? Well, we're one year we're basically one year into it, so we don't have a big track record. And certainly, there are a handful of kids who have been successful uh, in in putting together programs that make sense for them. The vast majority of kids who are engaged in uh, name, image, and likeness opportunities these are really modest opportunities. Now the media gets fixated on the the handful of ones that are, you know, seemingly just huge, huge dollar figures. Those are the exceptions and not the rules. Um, but uh, again, you look at, we've got NIL, we're one year into it. The one-time transfer rule, or unified one-time transfer year, we're one year into it. So there's going to be chaos in the system. Well, it's going to take us a year or two or three years for those waters to calm down a little bit, for the student athletes for the coaches and institutions to become more sophisticated. What we're seeing in the data around transfers, the vast majority of kids, when they transfer, if they are able to transfer, they transfer laterally or they transfer down. It's only a very small percentage of student athletes that, in fact, transfer up if there is such a thing as that. And so, again, I think the kids will get more sophisticated. I think there's a lot of kids who have jumped into the transfer portal right now. They're not playing where they're at. You know, let's take a flyer and see if we can go somewhere. Uh, they may find out that they don't have a place to land. And, again, people will pay attention. Other student athletes will pay attention. And, uh, again, they'll be smarter about it. They find out that the grass isn't greener somewhere else, and so maybe they should stay put. But at the end of the day, what is a positive, student athletes should have some level of freedom in where they go. They shouldn't find themselves forced to stay somewhere they don't want to be. And the unified one-time transfer rule provides that opportunity. We just need to learn how to, how to deal with that change and we'll adapt. That coming from Matt Commissioner Dr. John Steinbrecher here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios, looking at this world of, of evolution of everything when it comes to NIL and the transfer portal. We also look at the future of collegiate athletics as a whole, the future of the NCAA, the transformation committee, uh, rewriting a constitution and figuring out exactly what the divisions are going to be, what it's going to look like, what the overall encompassing rule is going to be. Uh, how do you look at that, that in a world where the student athlete, as you call it, is evolving, we are also looking at an evolution of the NCAA and a rewriting of essentially what these laws are, what the NCAA is as a body, and how we transform into the current age of collegiate athletics how do you see that in the bigger picture, that the NCAA is going through a remodeling of itself as well? Well, they absolutely are, and that's, that's a, a process of the fact that the NCAA, and when I say the NCAA, that means all the member institutions, all the conferences. I'm not just pointing my fingers at some folks in Indianapolis. You know, we tried to change by evolution which is very slow, and we've changed too slowly. So now as a result of political pressure, of uh, judicial rulings, we're going to change by revolution. It's going to be quicker. And the focus to a, to a large extent is going to be in, in mitigating risk uh, and finding a way in which we can deregulate to some extent. We, 
the NCA, our membership association, we do a really good job of making rules. We don't do a very good job of getting rid of rules. Well, that's what we're going to be focused on right now. What rules do we have to have on a national basis to conduct national championships? And then what rules can we can we manage at either the conference or institutional level? And so that's going to be unsettling and it's going to be uncomfortable. And it's that is going to be a work in progress over the next couple of years. Uh, but let's so be it. Let's embrace it. Let's figure out a way to make this thing work. Uh, we're one of the challenges when I talk about deregulating, when you every rule that's in that NCA rule book is there for a reason. It's because there probably was a problem associated with whatever area it covers. And so in name, image, and likeness, we currently really don't have many rules that govern it. So what happens is we there's a race to the bottom. Let's figure out a way to take advantage of every loophole or every way we can to, to do it. Well, as we deregulate rules, we may find ourselves with other issues similar to that. I hope I hope that's not the case, but you know we'll figure it out. And so the the focal point will become much more on conferences from um, an oversight of, of rules, I believe. And so conferences will have to have some some discussions and come to some agreement on how they want to manage. Uh, an array of issues because it's believed that if we manage rules on a conference basis uh, might be afforded a little more antitrust protection than we currently have when we try to do it on a national basis but at the baseline we have to define what is it to be a student athlete are they uh let's let's go to the the, what we would think the student athlete model, the amateur, they're not paid, they get a scholarship. At the other extreme is the employee model, right? They're, they're paid, maybe they go to classes, maybe they don't. Where do we end up on that? It's probably going to be somewhere in between is going to be my guess, but that's going to be a fundamental question we have to answer. And from that, so many other issues will, will evolve from. And it also may dictate what schools say, you know what, we agree with that model, we want to continue, or there may be other schools that say, you know what, that's not what we want to be. We'd rather go back to a need-based aid model or something uh, a little less aggressive than what you're talking about. And so those are the questions that will help us determine what we look like, oh, in 24 or 36 months. Uh, you know, and, and like you said, looking at in the deregulation and whatnot, if, if the NCAA is essentially the national government as, as a parallel and then looking at each conference as state governments, do you like that more that the Mid-American, the MAC can, can sit and say, hey, you know what, the SEC chose to do this, the Pac-12 is doing that, the Big South is doing that, but the MAC, we're going to do it this way. Do you like that or does that cause more confusion? Oh, um well, I, I will say this. It's challenging to conduct national championships without national rules. Yeah. And so how do we select those rules that we need to do nationally? I'm not afraid of the conversation of the Mid-American Conference of us digging in and say, okay, what are our priorities? How do we want to manage certain things? We've been doing that for some time. In fact, when I came on board over a decade ago, put us through a strategic planning process and we did a prioritization of an array of things and it helped guide us in terms of how we allocated resources where our focus went and i think that's what it'll what it will cause us all to do nationally but we do need some similarities in terms of you know how many how many student athletes are on a team and things like that and and i think we'll get to that place but you hit on exactly the right thing. It's, again, conferences are going to have to dig in and figure out what, what's, what makes sense for them. And they need to do it in a way that they're not having that conversation with another conference. You can't collude with somebody on that. You have to make those decisions independently. And as we see it, like you said, you've worked with FBS, FCS, and you've worked with Division One schools as a commissioner that don't, you know, dealing with schools that don't have football. So when you have gone through all of this and seen the many angles of it, you know that in the world that we live in today, if you look at FBS, FCS, and Division One in general, just looking at at 
Division One for football, the FBS has started to defi- divide itself, right? There's a quote-unquote Power Five. There's a quote-unquote Group of Five. Within the Power Five, the SEC is going to 16 with Oklahoma and Texas. Then within the Power Five, we see in this autonomy group that there is a joint alliance within the Group of Five. Within the Power Five, there's another alliance of three between the Big Ten, the Pac-12, and the ACC. So with, within just the FBS, we're seeing the SEC stand on its own. We're seeing an alliance. We're seeing the Power Five. We're seeing the Group of Five. How do you begin to understand this knowing that just the FBS alone has created its own factions at this point? Uh, some of it's natural evolution. So you've got to get back to, okay, what, where, what's our foundational relationship? If you're playing FBS football, your foundational relationship is we all want to be a part of that college football playoff. Yeah. We're all all 10 signatories of that college football playoff. We all have that in common. And that is a, that is a monster relationship. I can't, I, I can't underestimate how important or overestimate how important that is to all of us. And so it starts from there. And so, yeah, there are differences of opinion and this group might want to do one thing one way and another thing another way. At the end of the day, we all come together in and around football and the postseason of football. And to me, that's a big positive. When you look at the future of this, uh, we saw an expansion conversation come about and it was sent out to us in the media the different pieces that it had to go through the different steps that needed to be taken in order to look at expanding the college football playoff from four teams we heard about 12 then Oklahoma and Texas made their announcement of leaving the Big 12 for the SEC and everything got quiet where do you think we are on college football playoff expansion and how bad do we need it in your opinion well I I think it's in the eye of the beholder. I think expanding it would be positive for college football. We could do it in a way that uh, actually brings more value to the regular season, which I didn't think was something that could be done. But after we went through this past year and spent so much time studying uh, one or more of the proposals, I think there is a way to do it that brings greater value to the regular season, keeps more teams engaged in the hunt to be in the playoffs to later in the season brings more value to our TV, brings more value to our championship games. I think there's pretty strong consensus around wanting to expand. Now, there are a few differences of opinion exactly on what that means. Is it eight teams? Is it 10 teams? Is it 12 teams? Is it 16 teams? Whatever that may be. Uh, We're going to, you know, next year or two, we'll get that figured out. I, I really think we'll get there. Uh, and I think it'll be wonderful. I, I, you know, the more the more teams that have a chance to play in it, the more teams we have that are going into late October or early November that are still relevant. Just think what that does and assists you in terms of ticket sales, in terms of TV rates, in terms of all of those things. Those are positives. Uh, and for football, college football, at least at the FBS level, has the lowest participation of student athletes in a national championship event across any of the sports. We have 3% of play in it right now. The norm is somewhere between 18 and 25%. So uh, I really I really think we'll get there, uh, but it's not likely to occur until this existing contract expires. And we've got four more years on, I believe it's four more years, four or five, but I apologize for not knowing off the top of my head how many years are left there. But um, we'll get there and it will continue to be a great, great event. That coming here from Mac Commissioner Dr. John Steinbrecher on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. John, what is the max conversation when it comes to the college football playoff? What is the, the max spotlight, the max selling points? What, what, if you were sitting at a table right now and the college football playoff was looking at expanding and, and having the winners of each of these 10 conference championships have an opportunity to play in the college football playoff, what would you say on behalf of the MAC? I mean, I know I know a bunch of the coaches within the MAC. There's a lot of good here. I know that you're willing to play on any given day. We get to see MAC throughout the week, and it's there's a lot to be said 
about this conference itself from those that take the time and are, you know, informed enough to pay attention to it. What would you say to the college football playoff committee about the MAC and why the MAC should have an opportunity to fight for a championship? You know, when you, you sit back and think about it, FBS football is such a small number of schools participating at that level out of the thousand and some schools across all of, of the NCA, across all divisions, there's about 135 that play FBS football. College football is healthier when all of the participants, particularly all of the participants at the FBS level, are robust and healthy. And having a chance to participate in that event uh, will only enhance all of the conferences and, more importantly, all of those member institutions. Uh, just think of the excitement it will bring. Think of it as our coaches are out there recruiting and talking about, no, it's not just a possible chance to be there. If we if we do this or this, it's, hey, if we win our league, we know we're going to be one of X teams in that event. We've seen what's occurred in college basketball and uh, how robust that sport is and how vibrant that sport is. It's why the month of March is really one of the great sports months of the year. Well, we can have a similar sort of thing with college football. And when you look at your, your full-time members and we look at football and, and beyond, Ohio, Bowling Green, Miami of Ohio, Akron, Buffalo, Kent State, Toledo, Northern Illinois, Western Michigan, Eastern Michigan, Central Michigan, and Ball State, how would you define the MAC? When I say those names and those schools and the tradition of each of those schools that have comprised your conference and created in a world of realignment, you know, some some consistency, how would you describe the MAC when you look at these full time institutions that have given so much to making the MAC what it is today? It's the seventh oldest conference in the country. It is among the most stable. Uh, we haven't had changes in, gosh, I think well over 20 years. We know who we are. And one of the things I talk about uh, with regularity with our membership and with others is we need to continue to understand who we are and let's be the map. I'm not trying to be the Big Ten or the SEC or the Mountain West or anything else. Let's know what our strengths and weaknesses are. Let's play to those strengths. And as it turns out, our top teams in whatever sport it is are competitive nationally. So if we can continue to do that, let's be the MAC. We're going to be just fine. And, and we look at the the MAC as well. The affiliate members of this conference, so many across a bunch of different sports: Appalachian State for field hockey, Bell Armin for field hockey, Binghamton for men's tennis, uh, Bloomsburg for wrestling, Clarion for wrestling, Cleveland State for wrestling, uh, Detroit Mercy for women's lacrosse, Edinburgh for wrestling, uh, Evansville for men's swimming and diving, George Mason for wrestling, Georgia State for men's soccer, Georgia Southern as well for men's soccer, Lock Haven for wrestling, Longwood for field hockey, Missouri State for men's swimming and diving, Ryder for wrestling, Robert Morris for women's lacrosse, SIU Edwardsville for wrestling, Southern Illinois for men's swimming and diving, Valparaiso for men's swimming and diving, West Virginia for men's soccer, Youngstown State for women's lacrosse, the affiliation, I mean, we look at, like you said, the seventh oldest conference, you haven't had changes in two decades, and then you look at all of these affiliations that are able to build and expand the name. How would you define affiliate members, and why are you willing to work with so many across the country? Generally speaking, you add affiliate members when you have gaps or holes in sports sponsorship, and you need to you need to find additional members so you can continue to sponsor the sports. The sport we have the most affiliate members in is wrestling, and we have a, a whole bunch. But there's purpose behind that. We had a chance. This is four or five years ago. We needed to pick up one or two affiliate members. And as we were looking at folks, we were zeroing on a conference, East Coast based conference in wrestling, largely a bunch of schools in Pennsylvania and a few other spots. And we clearly could have cherry picked that conference. That would have been healthy for us and good for us. It would not have been positive for that conference. And it was a standalone wrestling conference. And it would not have been healthy for the sport of wrestling. So we made the decision, let's invite that whole conference in to join us. And that's been very, very positive. Uh, other places, again, it's plugging in the hole and let's make sure we're, there's a reason behind it 
that we have good alignment, we have similar values. And again, it's worked really, really well. In the sport of men's soccer, for instance, we had seven member institutions, including affiliates that played the sport last year. Five of our seven teams went to the NCAA championship. One, one into the second round, another into the to the Elite Eight. I mean, it's, it's a way for us to bolster the league, continue sponsoring those sports, um, and just have great, great conference competition. For you to, to oversee them all, like you said, you know, when you have affiliate members, you're filling, filling in the gaps of different sports that you need to stay sponsored and stay there and whatnot. How do you balance that when you have your full-time members that you take care of and you sit down and you meet with? How do you make sure as a commissioner that you're balancing and giving attention and also welcoming in these schools that are there for that one sport that they're affiliated with? How do you balance the affiliated members to the full-time? Well, you do it on a sport-by-sport -sport basis. And our philosophy is if they're a member in that sport, they're as important in that sport as every other member. So we try not to differentiate uh, like yeah, among full members and affiliate members. In our wrestling, for instance, affiliate members can host our championship. There are a number of leagues. If you're not a full member, you're not hosting the championship. If you're a member, you're a member. Uh, coming here from Dr. John Steinbrecher here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, Matt Commissioner. Uh, John, before I let you go here inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios, uh, to take a look at mental health, I know that's something that you've worked on. It's been uh, very important with you. A first conference-wide mental health program, which included the development of minimum standards and best practices and a biannual summit on mental health. Just what you can say about the place that mental health has awareness-wise in our world today because growing up as a kid, I could tell you that uh, more often than not, people would tell me, figure it out, as opposed to actually having a place to go or even a conversation about mental health. So how important is it and why did you want to make sure that you were starting the trend as opposed to responding to the trend when it came to taking care of mental health? Mental health issues are a public health crisis, plain and simple. It's not a student athlete, it's not a student issue, it's an everybody issue. And we actually got this from our students who about a decade ago now came to us and said, hey, we'd, we'd like to see us focus on that. And, and away we went. It's funny, coming out of this year's spring meetings, uh, we had we dug in on it again and our student athletes again asked us, you know, continue to focus on this. Please put as many resources into this as are possible. Uh, in some ways, student athletes are, are are fortunate. They have a they have a group that they belong to. They have people providing some oversight. But even with that, they oftentimes feel isolated because they may be competing against teammates, or they don't want to share what their weaknesses are. We spend a lot of time and need to continue to do it on an education part of for a student athlete to perform at their best. They have to be at their peak level physically, they have to be at their peak level uh, mentally, and they have to be at their peak level from a, a spiritual or inner, inner person perspective. And so we need all of those things working together. Our student athletes came up with a phrase that it's okay to not be okay. And so again, let's reiterate that. Let's treat a mental health issue, whether it's an eating disorder, anxiety, depression, thoughts of suicide, what, whatever it may be, let's treat those much in the way we would a, a banged up elbow or knee or shoulder and not be afraid to seek advice and treatment and take care of it so that you can get back to being the best you can be. And what has it taught you, John, as, as you look and, and get deeper into the world of the student athlete, I know that obviously you competed as well growing up and whatnot. So when you look at student athletes today and everything that they're going through, how has it made you a better person by overseeing a conference and working with so many different people from so many different backgrounds, from different parts, uh, you know, different states and, and maybe a similar part of the country, but, you know, for the most part, you know, dealing in the Midwest and then obviously in the state of New York and whatnot, but how have you evolved yourself from seeing what a student athlete goes through today? Well, 
Uh, certainly we have some shared experiences, but having said that, I think the pressures on student athletes are probably more today than they ever been simply because of, of the exposure levels, the social media, all these other things. And, and so there's so many eyes on them. There's so many people commenting, so many people commenting, uh, anonymously. Uh, and so all of those kind of add up. Uh, the flip side is all, I've also learned or evolved our greatest resource for ideas are our student athletes. We've, we've really come to embrace them. We've made them part of our governance system. We ask them on issues on a pretty regular basis. What do you think about this? How, where would we go with that? That's, you know, it's how we got pursuing mental health. That's how we led the way on uh, issues around time demands or like the hours student athletes put into uh, sports on a weekly and monthly basis. All those types of things have come from the student athletes. And so we just need to continue to have dialogue and listen um, and embrace these young men and women who we hope are having transformative educational experiences that'll last with them for an entire lifetime. And John, quickly here before I let you go, I mentioned the fact that, you know, we you call it Maction. And I've talked with people throughout the country, lovers of different sports and, and whatnot, just people that are sports fans in general. And when you say the Mac, they say, I got to get some Maction. They like their Tuesday games, they like their Wednesday games. They like that they can see the Mac uh, throughout the week, that they don't have to wait until the weekend when it comes to football and whatnot. What can you say about, I know you've, you've worked with CBS Sports Network. I know you've obviously worked with ESPN as well, making sure that your games are going to be out there and then, you know, expand it out from that to make sure Olympic sports and men's and women's basketball will be as well. But to know that this conference is willing to play on days that other conferences may not want to and to really be a part of our entire week, what has that done for selling the message? And how would you describe Maction? coming from the commissioner yourself. Maction's fast-paced, exciting, vibrant uh, sports activity. And, and also we use it, another way we use it is in terms of taking Maction. And when we use it in that context, it's about being socially aware and civically engaged. Uh, so we use it in a bunch of different ways. Um, you know what? I can't think of another conference that has a, a single word catchphrase that really everybody knows what it is. They click on it very quickly. We've been so stable. They probably can name most of the schools. Uh, so it's special and we're, we're protective of it. Uh, and it's helped take what was a really nice regional conference and helped make us a national brand. It's a great way to put it, that coming from Dr. John Steinbrecher. John, you spent a good amount of time with us here today describing a lot of uh, different pieces of not only the MAC, but also the future of collegiate athletics. And you just said it, you know, you, you have not expanded on the conference having more than 12 and you haven't lost any of those 12. You've been consistent. People know who you are. And I think that that is a fleeting thing in today's world. So I want to thank you for your time here in our Commissioner Central Series. And I would love to have you back on soon. And uh, now I get to officially tell you that I've been a big time fan of the Mac for a while and got some good friends in there. Uh, Tim Lester at Western Michigan and Fred Reed, who just passed at Eastern Michigan to, to name a couple. But I really do appreciate the work that you're doing. And thank you for everything the Mac is bringing to collegiate athletics. And I really do appreciate your time. I'll look forward to being back with you and your listeners again soon. In these unique times, there are those in our community that give us a sense of normalcy and positivity. Pizza Man on 50 Oswego Street in Baldwinsville has been here for you for over 35 years and is here now. Call 315 638 1234 or order online at pizzamanbville.com to bring those familiar tastes into your home. And remember to come see our monthly on-site broadcasts centered around the community and our Baldwinsville Bees. Pizza Man in Baldwinsville. Any way you slice it, they are always here for you.
This is Jimmer Sikowski, owner-operator of Chick-fil-A Cicero, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero, right in front of the Home Depot. I had a deep feeling that God wanted me to do something bigger with my life and to help people, help others. I kept putting Chick-fil-A in my life, and I realized as I was going through the franchise selection process that uh, positively impacting the lives of others was really core to what we do here at Chick-fil-A. First of all, it starts with the food. The food is brought in fresh daily, and we bring in local produce. We prepare to order in the kitchen. We hand bread our chicken. We hand spin our milkshakes. It's it's great food. It doesn't taste like fast food. I, I think the second thing is is the way people feel when they come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. It's different. We we try to treat people with intentional kindness here, which is very different and deeper than good customer service. And so I think it feels remarkable for most people to come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. And then lastly. The impact that we try to have in the community is very different. It's a big part of the expectation of every operator of a Chick-fil-A restaurant is that they're actively engaged in their community, they're a leader in the community, and they're, they're making a difference. When they realize that what we're striving to do is to shine a little light in their life, that's a very, very different experience uh, than you will have at any other quick service restaurant. And it's that remarkable experience that I think people will emotionally connect with. I'm George Townsend of Honda City with some good advice from buying a new car. The true cost of owning a new car is determined by the appraised value when you trade it. No vehicle appraises higher than a Honda. Next, look for low APRs and deep discounts. You also want low maintenance costs and great fuel economy. That's why my advice to you is to buy a new Honda. Looking pre-owned, visit our Honda Certified Used Car Center. Honda City, 7140 Henry Clay Boulevard, Liverpool, or hondacity-cny.com. It would be a pity if you don't shop at Honda City. Our corporate purpose at Chick-fil-A is to glorify God by being faithful stewards of all that's entrusted to us and to possibly influence all those who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. And what became increasingly clear from our success in Cicero is that people love Chick-fil-A. And also, I think we recognize that, you know, we had a great opportunity to grow the brand and grow our platform. I felt incredibly grateful when I was you know, selected to be a Chick-fil-A operator. I think what it's meant for me, what I've come to realize on a very deep level is that this is a calling for me. It's not a career. It's not a job. The Lord called me to be a Chick-fil-A operator and to use these restaurants to glorify Him and to positively influence other people. I'm blessed. I'm very blessed. Head to Chick-fil-A Clay on 3974 State Route 31 in Liverpool, New York. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets that thing called life. Very happy to be here with you inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios, 3501 James Street, 324 West Water Street, and 401 South Salina Street is where you'll find Cafe Kubal in Syracuse, New York. you also find them out in Manlius on 343 Fayette Street, and you'll find them on the corner of Route 11 and Taft road at sweetheart corners in their drive through location in north syracuse as well fill your cup up with your favorites today hot or iced their chais are my absolute favorite and my go-to and i am a big fan of numerous flavors that they have including their pumpkin of course their mint and their lavender fantastic and vanilla fantastic flavors at Cafe Kubal Brown Sugar as well to put inside of your chai or you could put it inside of any of your drinks. And like I said, get them hot or get them iced. If you're out of town, go to CafeKubal.com and get yours today sent to your doorstep. So with that being said, it is at that part of our Tuesday broadcast where they have the opportunity right at 1045 a.m. Eastern Time, we're right on the dot here to bring you the ingredients to success. Proudly presented by the wonderful people at Avicoli's. And I want to thank Nick and John and the entire team at Avicoli's for all that you do. And we owe you one for the ingredients to success. So we're doing a double dose of the ingredients to success today on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets that thing called life. So our first topic for the ingredients to success this morning is going to be change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. I used to think that I could change change. I could keep change from changing. <laughs> and so that is not the case. You cannot stop change from happening. 
Change is inevitable. So what do we do with it? What do we do when it comes to change? What are the ingredients to success for dealing with change? Well, first and foremost, it's knowing that, that it's inevitable. It's understanding that it's going to happen. Whether or not we want change to occur, change will happen. Gas prices rose, okay? They went from $1.99 to 5 bucks, $4.99. God only knows where it is where you are. Hopefully not anymore. Hopefully much less is what it'll go to. But, right, that's change. Change happened. It was inevitable that somebody was going to do this as they talked about it and they talked about it and they talked about it and it happened. Now, the question of whether or not it should have happened, well, that's that's a topic for, for a many-day discussion. But the reality of it all is change is inevitable, right? Gas prices didn't stay low. They changed. So what do we do to address it, right? Some of us have a finite amount of money that we make. So it's hard. So you put a little bit in and you do a little bit where you can. Maybe you try to travel a little bit less. Maybe you try to do a little bit less. But that's, it's change. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. And we don't always want it to happen, but it happens. So gas prices go up, right? Players get traded from the team that we love. We are in a relationship and things are great. And then three months in or five months in, eight months in, there's change. There's change. And how do we deal with change? Well, we have to understand we can't control it. The first way to deal with change is understanding that change is not in your power. Unless it's you changing. Unless you desire to change. Outside of that, change change happens on its own. Change is going to do what change wants to do. So, you have to know that it's inevitable and you have to know that you can't control something else from changing. Once something changes, how will you adjust? How will you be to the change? What will you do to address the change? Because we all have to deal with it. We all have to deal with change. So how do you deal with change? Well, you got to be positive, just like with anything else. You have to be positive. You have to find a way to move forward. Because life is going to present us with many obstacles. And there are going to be many changes, right? People pass away that we love dearly. Dogs and cats and animals and pets pass away that we love dearly. Disney's prices skyrocket, right? I love Disney. But I hear a lot of families complain about it now. And I understand so what do we do to address all of this, all of this change? How do we deal with it? Well, we control what we can control, right? We save money. If we want to go and do these things, maybe when gas price is going up, we spend a little bit less going out to eat and we cook at home. Because we could sit here and complain about change. Well, gas prices are high. Well, it's high, you know, the airline prices were next to nothing. Now they're high again. Well, you know, it costs a lot for us to go on this vacation. The hotels went up. Disney went up. You can sit and complain about the rise in Disney prices, but it's not going to change the prices. You could sit and complain about the rise in gas prices, but it's not going to change the gas prices. What we can do as a society is... Try to save a little bit of money where we can, right? Maybe we go and we talk to our representatives and we try to make change. We discuss it. We talk about it. But we address it, right? You know that change is inevitable. You know you can't control it. But what are you going to do once it happens? Are you going to talk about it? Are you going to fight in a positive way without your fists but with your words and with your actions are you going to be dutiful? Are you going to try to do things to make an absolute difference? Or are you just going to sit there and complain? Because a lot of us complain when change happens. 
You know, we don't like it. We don't like it. We don't want to do it. But what does that change? What changes about change when all we do is sit and talk about change? Sometimes change happens and it's great. Sometimes change happens and it's undesirable. But it will happen and we need to adjust. We need to adjust. So what do we do? Like I said, when it comes to money, right? This costs a little bit more now, so maybe you save somewhere else. Okay? Maybe you do that. Maybe you write down the things that are most important to you and you spend money on those things. And the things you could do without, maybe you do without. Nobody wants to have to give something up. But maybe you don't need that, right? Maybe you've been waiting to sell a bunch of stuff on eBay and you got a ton of action figures and they're in your closet. You don't even look at them. You don't even know what you have. But somebody else might want that. So maybe you go and you sell a few of those. Maybe you put a few of those out there. You don't want to get rid of them. You don't want to let go of them. But what are they gaining by having dust there on, on your mantle? So maybe today is the day that you let them go and you make a few more bucks. And now all of a sudden, you got rid of something that you weren't paying attention to to make money for something that you need. Change in relationships. We don't like that, right? When relationships change, if it's not positive, we're not fans of that. But what do we do? How are we going to address it? How are we going to address change when it happens in our relationships? Are we going to sit there and complain? Listen, things change. But is it a good change or is it not a good change? Is it a positive thing or is it something we didn't sign up for? Because we have every right, and people forget this, you have every right to end a relationship. Whether it's a business partnership, whether it's you working somewhere, or it's a personal relationship, a romantic relationship, a friendship. Maybe it's somebody in your family that's just so, they've just gotten so dramatic, they've gotten so negative, they've gotten so down. Change. You can not stop it, but you can address it in your life. So how do I deal with change? Well, number one, I understand I can't control it. Number two, I decide whether or not I like that change. And is that change going to stay? I'm an affectionate person. So if I was in a relationship romantically with somebody and that affection went away, then I would address it. If it stayed away, then I would get out of the relationship. Because I'm an affectionate person. I want to hold your hand. I want to kiss you in public. I want to kiss you in private. I want to look in your eyes. I want to spend time with you. Quality time. I want you to put your hand on my shoulder. I want you to put your arm around me. I want you to put your hand in my back pocket. I don't want to be in a relationship where we're just walking next to each other like strangers. So if that change stayed that way, then how do I deal with change? Well, I let go of that relationship. That's how I deal with change in that sense. But in other cases, you know, things change like... Maybe somebody moves in with you, right? We've all been through that. We live somewhere. Somebody moves in with us or we move in with somebody. There's change, right? Because maybe there's maybe there's a certain thing you're used to. Maybe you get up every morning at the same time and go to the bathroom. And maybe it's the same time they get up. And maybe there's only one bathroom. And you want your privacy. So maybe you got to get up five minutes earlier. Because maybe they don't. So maybe you have to get up five minutes earlier. Or... Maybe you change your schedule and you do something else first and then come back to doing that second because you know that they're going to be in the bathroom doing that. So maybe you get dressed. Maybe you go downstairs and have your coffee and your morning toast a little bit earlier so that you can do that while they're getting ready and then you come upstairs and get ready because sitting there and complaining about it isn't going to change it. And that's what I think people don't understand about change is we can all complain, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't make anything better. Well, Dan, does that mean we shouldn't stick up when our gas prices and our milk prices? And No. I'm not saying you shouldn't stick up for yourself. I'm saying you should stick up for yourself. But complaining is a lot different than addressing something. Complaining is not fixing the problem. Complaining is just complaining. But when you want to fix a problem, come with it with factual evidence. Come with it with telling people's stories. Come with it with personal. People buy on emotion. We listen on emotion. We respond to emotion. We are emotional creatures, and we respond emotionally. 
to things. So when you address something with emotion, you have a lot better chance of getting that to come through. So address it with emotion. Talk about it. Get it through. Because I've had a lot of change in my life. I've had relationships come and go. I've had jobs come and go. When something isn't what I thought it would be, I had to address whether or not I wanted to stay in that situation. Do I want to stay in a job that isn't what they promised me it would be? Do I want to stay in a relationship that isn't what they promised me it would be? Do I want to keep going down this path knowing that this is not something that I signed up for? You have the right to say no. You have the right to figure it out. And you have the right to address it. So your ingredients to success for change, know that it's happening. Know that if it's not coming from you, you can't control it. And know that you can control how you respond to change. You can control what you're going to do once the change occurs. You can't stop it from happening. But you can stop yourself from going crazy over it. And you can address what you need to address and go from that point forward. Weather changes, right? What are you going to do? When it rains outside, do you sit and complain and do you cry about it and do you moan and do you yada, 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 yada? Or do you say, you know what? Okay, it rained. It snowed. I'm okay. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to be all right. You have the opportunity to make a decision about your life. Okay? And if you're in a situation where you can't make decisions about your life, you need to get out of that situation. Well, Dan, it's easier said than done. I understand that. But your life is precious, and you need to start living like every single day is your last day. Because when people tell me, well, I'm in a relationship I don't want to be in, but I can't just get out of it. What if today was your last day on earth? What if this was it? What if this was all you had and you gave me that excuse? Well, I can't just leave. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Well, Dan, it's not that easy. All the good things in life, they're not. So what are you going to do? Well, Dan, you make it sound really easy to get out of a bad situation. It's not easy to get out of a bad situation. But you know what I could tell you? It's worth it. Because if you spend every single day like it is your last day on earth, you would not be saying, I'm going to do it tomorrow. 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 Because tomorrow comes, but it never comes. What do I mean by that? Tomorrow comes, but it never comes. Because tomorrow does come, but when you keep saying you're going to do it tomorrow, eventually there is no tomorrow to that tomorrow that you're talking about. You're going to do it, right? You're going to do it. When? When are you going to apply for that job? When are you going to leave that job? When are you going to get away from that volatile relationship? When are you going to make a change in your life? We, you know, I don't hang around people that talk about, I'm going to, 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 I'm going to. I don't care. I don't care about I'm going to. I care about I did. I will. I have. I'm going to. Everybody says that. I'm going to change. I'm going to stop swearing. I'm going to stop being late. I'm going to stop saying this. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to apply for this job. I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to, 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 I'm going to. But did you? Did you? Or did you just become another person in the long line of I'm going to? Change is inevitable. What you do once it happens is going to be your life's work. So choose wisely. The second piece of the ingredients to success is we give you a double dose. And like I said, in our promotion on Twitter at call DT, Facebook at wake of call DT and Instagram at wake of call underscore DT. The beautiful thing about Avicoli's is when you get a double dose, right? When you get two helpings, there are no complaints. Hey, Dan, here's a slice of margarita, and we put another margarita on that margarita. Well, hello to my day. Hey, Dan, we got the barbecue chicken pizza today, and we got two slices left. Well, then, sign me up. 
If you get a double dose of avocolis, it's a good day. Because a single dose of avocolis is some good eating. Take it from one Italian to you. So our double dose of the ingredients to success, probably presented by avocolis, on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, right down the road from Liverpool High School. And we do all of our Liverpool Warriors exclusive sit-down specials at avocolis every single month. And you can come out and see us. Our second topic for the ingredients to success today stay a kid stay a kid what do i mean by that you want me to never grow up dan you want me to never be mature i didn't say that stay a kid what do i mean stay a kid it means no matter how old you get don't forget what makes you happy don't forget the little things that always bring you back don't forget what made you happy in its simplicity simplicity the older you get the more simple things you should hold on to because they remind us of who we are you want to know what made me feel good last night right next to my bed i have a sign that says i love you a bushel and a peck do you know why i have that sign because g mama said it to me all the time i love you a bushel and a peck and a squeeze around the neck but she didn't say a squeeze she said a squeeze in her high voice that she would do. I love you a bushel and a peck and a squeeze around the neck. I touched that sign last night. And you know what I thought of? I thought about when I slept over at my grandma's house. I thought about all the fun we had. I thought about how much I loved just having toast with my grandma. I love swimming in her pool. I loved sitting with her in her nightgown when we would just watch shows. I loved holding her hand in silence. And I loved her kisses and the way she always smelled the same. I got all of that from touching a sign. I thought to myself, how great was it to have sleepovers with G-Mama? How great was it to just be at her house and get to spend all night with my grandma? I'm 36 years old. And when I touched that sign last night and I went back to just being at the house with her and not needing anything. I didn't need Disney. I didn't need X an Xbox. I didn't need a PlayStation. I didn't need money. I didn't need material anything. All I wanted when I touched that sign was to go back to my grandma's house and just be with her. And I saw myself as a little kid going over there saying, Hi, Grandma. You want to play a game with me? And she would always say yes. Get the cards out. Come on. Let's play. Oh, we'll play one. And then I got to go to bed. But she always said yes. She always said yes. And that brought me back. And I said to myself last night, I want you to focus on the simple things, Dan. When you get up in the morning that my dog licks my face like crazy. Lily licks me when I go to sleep. She licks my head. And she licks my head when I wake up in the morning. It's it's a good morning. The last thing that she wants me to have when I go to sleep is a kiss from her. And the first thing she wants me to have when I wake up is a kiss from her. God, you got to enjoy that while you got them. I still remember the day that Shady passed away. She perked up her ears. She looked at the door when I walked in. And she gave me about 42 kisses that day. And I said, she's giving me, she's banking them. She's giving me kisses for the time that she won't physically be here to do it. She is giving me a kiss for every day that I'll need it. And she won't physically be here to give me one. Simple things. You have to simplify your life. Children... I asked my godson today what he wanted for his birthday. He said, action figures and video games. That's it. He's got a big imagination. And he's got a million action figures, but they mean something to him. And he appreciates them. Action figures and video games. The older we get, 
the more we complicate our lives. We make life harder than it has to be. Right? We ask for love, but we don't work on ourselves to be ready to give it. We ask for the promotion, but we're not prepared for that meeting. We want the ball in our hands. And then some of us get the ball in our hands at the end of the game and we're starstruck. We don't know what to do. You can't just ask for the moment. You have to be ready for it. So stay a kid. Because as a child, it's simple. You love your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You love your tuna fish sandwich. You love that your friend walks with you home every day. You love riding your bike. You love the smell of the grass on a Saturday morning when you go play wiffle ball with your friends. You love that your mom always gets your favorite juice and always has it ready. You love sleepovers with your best friend. You love running in the backyard just because. You love playing in the sprinkler. Adults would be so much better to each other if we played in a sprinkler more. If we enjoyed sitting down and not having our phone, not having a pen, not multitasking, but just eating a sandwich in silence, just eating a, how, when was the last time you just ate that you just sat down and ate a sandwich? When was the last time you picked up a sandwich and you ate it without doing a million other things? When was the last time? But as a kid, you couldn't wait to run in the house and have your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Mom, did you get the grape? Oh, I like strawberry, Ma. Honey, babe, I got them both. Remember when going to get an ice cream cone was the greatest part of your week? Just driving a Carvel in the back of the truck? Stay a kid. Because kids get it. If this world, and we joke about it, but it's true. If this world was run by children's minds, they would be honest. They would ask questions. They would tell you when something doesn't make sense. And they appreciate things. See, the older we get, sometimes the more cynical we get. The older we get, the more we get set in our ways. The older we get, the more we think we are the only right voice. The only right mind. The only right person in the world. And it's not true. Stay a kid. You know what I want from my fiance? I want to have fun with her every day. When the relationship's not fun, then I'm not having fun. You know what I want for my dog every day? To have fun. To play with her. You know? And that's what she wants from me. That's what she wants from me. So how dare me not ask that of my fiance, of my best friend, of my mom, of my dad? The same thing that my dog Lily asked of me. Lily loves playing fetch. And there's days when we don't play. And she'll look at me like, Dad, I just want five minutes for you to throw the ball. And how many of us wait until the day where, they th where we throw the ball at nothing and we cry? Because they're not there anymore. And we finally realized that all they ever wanted was five minutes. We are people that live so much of our lives saying, I wish I did this when I had the chance. But when a kid wants to play, they play. When they want to scratch their arm, they scratch their arm. When they want to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. When they want to say I love you, they say I love you. When a little kid wants to do something, they say, Mommy, Daddy, that's what I want to do. But as an adult, we tell everybody what we're going to do. But how many, times do we, how many times do we actually do it? Look at the shirt I'm wearing today because I'm a big kid. Look at the shirt I'm wearing. 
What does this shirt say? It says Sivako. Sivako. In the language of the Avatar humanoids, I guess we would call them. Of the movie Avatar. They're not real. But their message is real to me. And I'm a big kid. What does my shirt say? Sivako. What does that mean? It's written around it. It means rise to the challenge. Rise to the challenge. Sivako. Seize the moment. Rise to the challenge. I'm a big kid. I wear clothes that are Disney and Marvel and DC. Why do I do that? Because I don't want to wear suits? No. Because I'm irresponsible and immature? No. Because I am so mature. I don't want to say it like that because I don't want to say it in a cocky way. Because I, I don't mean it like that. There's a level of maturity that you get to where you realize that being who you are and being proud of who you are is all that matters. It doesn't matter what people think. I don't care if you like my shirt. I don't care if you like my style. I don't care if you like my hair. I don't care if you like my goatee. I don't care if you like the rings that I wear or the bracelet that I have on. I don't care if you like the color of my shorts and I don't care if I match to you. I don't care. Because I'm me. I'm a kid. I'm a big kid. And I love being a big kid. So stay a kid, folks. Why? Because kids have the most fun. If you would run around a little bit more, go out and shoot hoops, sing at the top of your lungs with the top down, play with your dog, play with your cat, go to Disney, or take all the merchandise you bought at Disney and make a room full of Disney that when you're having a rough day, you can come home and just open the door and go. And feel that feeling of being there. We complain about the things we can't do. What about the things you can? Maybe you can't afford to go to Disney every, every month. But maybe you can afford to make a Disney room in your house. Maybe you can't afford to buy your kids all the PlayStations and the Xboxes and all this stuff. But you got a big imagination and you can do what I did. I made paper versions of it that you opened up, string made paper remote controls and had pop-up figures. I created Game Boys out of tape, paper, and a pen. And I created like 70 some odd games that you could put in and then you'd pretend to play them. They were Game Boys that were made with my imagination and I made the games to go in them. And I had people ask me if I would make them some. Well, Dan, that's not the same. It's better. Because your Game Boy has a finite thing that, that it will do. That Game Boy will do a finite thing. The Nintendo DS will do... It has games that are finite. My imagination, Mario can go anywhere. I can have 90 levels if I want. My imagination is what keeps me young. My imagination is what keeps me ripe. My imagination is what makes me who I am. My imagination is me. Anybody can buy a video game, but not everybody has the same imagination. So your life may not be easy. Your life may not be in a place right now where you can afford to do this and afford to do that. But we could all afford to run around Look at the sky. Even if you're blind, you can go outside and put your face up to the sun and feel the warmth. Even if you don't have any legs, you can wheel yourself outside to sit and have a glass of iced tea with your mom. Even those of us that are going through the most pain are still here to enjoy 
the things that you loved as a kid. Sunshine, rainbows, blue skies, friendship, imagination, laughter. Stay a kid because it's the only way that you can ever truly be yourself and it's the only way that you'll ever truly know and tap into exactly who you are. The adult in you want, doesn't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. The kid in you always had time. So dance. Because you know what? The world, it's going to spin with or without you being who you are. But you, you're the one that loses when you don't spin. You're the one that loses when you don't dance. You're the one that loses when you don't laugh. You're the one that loses when you don't run around and just enjoy. The world will go on without you. But you, you'll never get anywhere by being something you're not. Stay a kid. Think about the things you loved as a kid. Think about all those positive, harmless things that you enjoyed as a kid. And reinterject them into your life. Because the alternative is losing everything that makes you special. Be who you are and be proud in the name of you. <laughs> My ingredients to success for you today are to stay a kid. And I just told you how. And being a kid's a lot easier than being an adult. Because when I tell you do something that connects you to your childhood, that might be just taking an hour to sit outside. It might be taking a drive with your dad. Someday you may not be able to take those drives. Someday you may not be able to make those phone calls. Someday you may throw a ball and there may be nobody there to fetch it. Some day, you may not be able to do the things that you don't have time to do today. So make time. We'll take a step aside for a fast break, and we'll come back and wrap up today's broadcast inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. This is Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life, and we'll be back in a moment. Cafe Cabal offers same-day local delivery of our products, offering no delivery charge for Onondaga County. Shop CafeCabal.com for fresh roasted coffee beans, cold brew, travel mugs, and all your essential Cafe Cabal needs. Cafe Cabal, coffee for the soul. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory remind us that every day is worth celebrating. Find them at 201 Old 7th North Street in Liverpool, New York. Open Monday through Saturday in store and all the time online at maandpazpopcorn.com. Serving our Central New York community and beyond, you can order all throughout the country at maandpazpopcorn.com. And remember to get your tins, which have in store half price refills forever. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory available to you for fundraising and all of your events by calling 315-450-6272. That's 315-450-6272. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory. How corny are you?
Welcome back here inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets that thing called life. I want to thank you for being a part of the show today and every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time, where sports meets life. On YouTube.com, Facebook.com, and MixLR.com, all backslash Wake Up Call DT, as well as on YouTube.com, or pardon me, on uh, Facebook.com backslash live now DT as well as wake up call DT.com. I wanted to tell you YouTube one more time. Why? Because we've had a great relationship with YouTube over the years and I appreciate them so very much. With over 200,000 plays and over 400 subscribers, we ask you to subscribe and join us on YouTube for all of our specials on YouTube.com backslash wake up call DT. With that being said, you can search Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on YouTube, on iHeartRadio, on iTunes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, MixLR, TuneIn, as well as Podbean and more. Amazon Music, Audible. All you have to do is look up Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on any one of these wonderful, beautiful outlets or one word, Wake Up Call DT. And we can't wait to connect with you there. With that being said, we want to thank our central and upstate New York partners, Cafe Cabal and beyond. Uh, Cafe Cabal, Carvel DeWitt, The Wildcat Sports Pub, Mod Pods Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory, Avicoli's, K9 Camp Dog Daycare, K9 Campground Dog Boarding, PB&J's Lunchbox, Honda City of Liverpool, Pizza Man, Chick-fil-A Cicero and Chick-fil-A Clay, and Mother's Cupboard. Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora is also the proud multimedia marketing partner exclusively of your Lemoyne College Dolphins. It's fins up every single month on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. On Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, you can stay tuned for AD and DT on the first and third Wednesday of each month. We feature Athletics Director Bob Beretta of Lemoyne and myself, Dan Tortora, with special topics, including our exclusive first conversation with Lemoyne about reclassification and realignment as they take a look of jumping from Division 2 to Division 1. We gave you the exclusive first conversation about that and the exclusive two updates on that. So three videos all on our Lemoyne tab. If you go to the Lemoyne tab on wakeupcalldt.com, our archive has been updated for Lemoyne and you can check it all out there. You can also subscribe to youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt and find us there as well with all of our Lemoyne coverage. So, for exclusives and so much more with AD and DT, and every second and fourth Wednesday, when we have the opportunity to speak with student athletes, coaches, administration, future Dolphins, and alumni, you can find all of that on youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt and the Lemoyne tab of wakeupcalldt.com as well. With fantastic conversations with Bob Beretta, Dr. Linda Lemura, the president of Lemoyne College, as well as the fantastic coaches and student athletes, future Dolphins and alumni. I have been absolutely so very thankful for our first year with Lemoyne, and I'm very ecstatic about what we have coming up in year number two. You can find all of that and more information by going to LemoyneDolphins.com. <music> The Marywood University Pacers are also exclusive multimedia marketing partners here with Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora as we have the opportunity to bring you Pacer Pride every single Friday in our specials that air in hour number two between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Eastern Time. On Fridays, we bring you the Marywood Pacers weekly on Wake Up Call. You can check out the Pacers by going to the Marywood tab on wakeupcalldt.com, which has also been updated this week with plenty of content for your Marywood University Pacers. You can also head off to the youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt channel, and you can find the Marywood content there as well. For more information on your Pacers and to understand what Pacer Pride truly means, go to marywoodpacers.com. The Brian and Stratton Bobcats of Syracuse are also exclusive multimedia marketing partners here with Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. We have had the opportunity to sit down with national champions, teams going after a national championship, as well as new programs starting for the first time for their inaugural season, as well as the incredible exclusive breaking news of new head coaches being hired with the Brian and Stratton College Bobcats of Syracuse. In just a few months, we have brought you exclusive upon exclusive breaking news on top of breaking news with the Bryant and Stratton Bobcats 
of Syracuse, and there's much more to come. We barely scratched the surface with our Bobcat Buzz specials that you can find by going to the BSC SYR tab, as well as by on wakeupcalldt.com, as well as by going to our YouTube channel and subscribing to youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt. For more information on your Bobcats, go to syracuse.bscbobcats.com. I want to thank you for watching and listening to today's broadcast, as always. And, of course, for the most up-to-date information, catch us on Facebook at Wake Up Call DT, Twitter at Call DT, and Instagram at Wake Up Call underscore DT. I want to thank my guest, Dr. John Steinbrecher, the commissioner of the Mid-American Conference, a.k.a. the MAC, bringing us some MAC-tion today on the broadcast. I've waited a long time to speak with the head of the MAC, and I'm happy that we finally got to do it. Thank you to the entire team behind the scenes for making this possible. Inside of on PazPopcorn.com's What's Poppin'. Thank you to Dr. John Steinbrecher for continuing our Commissioner Central series as we feature commissioners and executive directors from around the country, giving their thoughts on their conference, as well as taking a look at the grander scheme of what collegiate athletics are and what they could become as we move forward, as well as their hopes. And your double dose of the ingredients to success brought to you by Avicoli's on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York. Go to myavicolis.com to order online. And for takeout delivery and catering, call 315-622-5100. That's 315-622-5100. And, of course, they are open Tuesday through Sunday for indoor and outdoor seating, the pizza side, as well as their fine dining side and their bar. So many different ways to experience Avicoli's on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road, down the road from Liverpool High School in Liverpool, New York, a staple of the community and a proud partner of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Head over to Avicoli's today and make sure you head out to see us every single month as we do our Liverpool Warriors athletic specials with the fantastic people from Liverpool High School. So thank you to all of you for listening and watching once again. Thank you to Dr. John Steinbrecher. Thank you to Avicoli's for the ingredients of success. And thank you for supporting local and supporting Central New York. In the meantime, I will talk with you tonight at 5.30 p.m. as we have a Baldwinsville Bees championship broadcast extravaganza featuring the Baldwinsville Bees girls lacrosse team after winning their state championship on the heels just a couple days after they hoisted a state championship trophy. They will join me at Pizza Man Pub tonight, Tuesday, June, 20, June 14th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time on-site on location at Pizza Man on 50 Oswego Street in Baldwinsville, New York. Let's pack the pub as we always do. We'll see you there. And for those of you that can't make it or are out of town, you can watch us on youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt and on facebook.com backslash wakeupcalldt as you are right now. We'll see you tonight, and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow morning. Be safe, and as always, God bless, no stress, do your best. What does that mean? Keep God first and know that God has always blessed you and will always bless you, even when you think he's not. No stress. It'll kill you. Don't keep it in your life. Do your best. As long as you do that, you have nothing to apologize for, and it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. Be good and have a fantastic day. I'll talk with you soon. Be safe, everybody. From the Cafe Kubal Studios, this is Wake Up Call. You're amazing.